Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. All right, well, before we do get started... Uh, I want to uh, let you know today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. And you may support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. Uh, we truly appreciate all of your support. Well, now it's time for us to listen to today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. As we begin with The Open Town Matter, Parts 1 and 2. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Kearns, Johnny. Great Plains Garrity. Oh, hi, Ralph. Johnny, you're 52 years old. I am? Eight months ago, you married a lovely 27-year-old girl. Now I'm with you. A month later, you took out a $50,000 life insurance policy on a chief of police's salary. I did, huh? And who did I name as beneficiary? Your beautiful wife. Who else? So? So, three days ago, you were shot to death. Eh, I had a feeling it wasn't going to last. And 24 hours later, your wife files a claim on the policy. My friends tried to warn me she was fast. Well, there's the setup. What do you think? The same thing you probably do. In that case, you got just 56 minutes to catch the plane. The town is Greensport, Missouri. And watch yourself. What do you mean? From what I hear, Johnny, it's a wide open town. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the open town matter. Item 1, $84.60, transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Greensport and taxi to the townhouse hotel. I was hoping for a chance to shower and change, look around long enough to get my bearings and then edge into the case gradually. But it didn't work out that way. The case was already there and waiting for me right in the lobby of the hotel. All dressed up in a shiny black suit, squeaky black shoes, and a neater-than-neat little black bow tie. Oh, am I glad to see you, Mr. Dollar. Are you? Oh, indeedy, yes, I am. I just breathed a great big sigh. Relief, you know, when I heard you tell the clerk your name. That's how I know you're you, you know. You mean there's been some doubt? But of course you'll want to know I'm me, so I... Well, I'll swear I had a card in one of these pockets. Well, uh, maybe you could just tell me who you are, Mr. Uh... Potser, Averill P. Potser. I ought to have a card, though, to make it more official. Oh, never mind. I believe you. I must have given them all away. Don't worry, though. I'll get some more printed and see that you have one before you leave. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Potts. And now oh, I oh, Wait, me. Mr. Dollar. You want to talk to me, of course. Will I? Yes. I'm the agent here for the Great Plains Guarantee Company. I'm the one that sold that policy to the fellow that's dead. Oh, so that's it. Of course. <laughs> he wasn't dead then, you understand. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Feeling pretty lively, as a matter of fact, but with a new young wife and all that. I imagine so. But now uh, just... Mr. Dollar... Time. You've got to do something about that woman. Oh? Oh, she's driving me crazy. She wants her money, she says. $50,000. And she seems to think I'm carrying it around in my pocket. She's, uh, kind of anxious, huh? I'll tell you how anxious. Chief Blake was shot about two in the morning. And at three that afternoon, Marty, that's Mrs. Blake, was down at my office after a claim form. Yeah, I understand it was sent airmail special delivery. Well, she insisted on it. Made me take it straight to the post office as soon as she'd signed it. Pretty cold-blooded about it, huh? <laughs> Well, I've heard Marty Blake called a lot of different things in this town at different times, but never (laughs) cold-blooded. You follow me? I, uh, think I'm ahead of you. You know what I mean, all right, when you meet her. I can hardly wait. Man, oh man, wow. (laughs) 
Item two, a dollar and 15 cents taxi to the suburban home of Edgar Blake, former chief of police of Greensport, now deceased. On the strength of Potzer's description of the widow, I added a shave to the shower and change, and I hoped I looked a little fresher than I felt. The house was a rambling two-story job set back from the street. Well-kept shrubbery, nice lawn, quiet neighborhood, and plenty expensive. I wondered how Blake had been able to afford it. I was halfway up the walk when a man came out the front door. He wavered down the steps, then stopped and waited for me, rocking slightly on his heels. A copper. I can tell him a block away. You're a copper, right? Wrong. Private eye, maybe? No. Insurance investigator. Insurance. That's what I just asked her about. And you know what she did? Oh, threw you out, probably. Right. Said I was drunk. Oh, ridiculous. That's exactly what I said. Ridiculous, I told her. Ridiculous. But you know something? She was right, I am. No, I can hardly believe it. Well, it's a fact, though. At least a little bit. My name's Crayley, Joe Crayley. I'm a reporter. Greensport Daily Herald. Shiny dollar. Hiya, Joe. Insurance, huh? And he did have some, or you wouldn't have had any reason to be here. She was lying. No comment. Who's a beneficiary? <laughs> Still no comment. It's her, of course. Little smarty Marty. His ever loving little wife. How much is she going to make on the deal? Ah, uh, sorry, Joe. I... No comments. All right, let it lay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, tell me something, Joe. Uh, suppose I want a little action. Want to get into a poker game while I'm here. Find a crap table, maybe. Any idea where I could go? Sure. Anyone a half a dozen different... <laughs> How long you been in town, Johnny? Mm, about an hour. You wised up pretty fast, didn't you? Well, I didn't know it was a secret. The town is wide open, isn't it? It is. But I wouldn't go around poking into things if I were you. A guy could get hurt, you see what I mean? Maybe a guy did get hurt. Blake, you mean? What makes you think so? Well, if somebody wanted to keep the rackets going, the police chief would be a natural target, wouldn't he? Not necessarily. Meaning? No comment. What was Blake's salary, Joe? Six thousand a year. On six thousand, he was living in a house like this? Wait till you see Marty. She's even more expensive. So that's why Greensport is wide open. The police chief was in. No comment. Mm. Well, he's out now, that's for sure. Uh, Joe, I'll probably be talking to you later, so... Yeah, yeah, do that. Just ask anybody. Joe Crayley, the alcoholic that works for the Herald. I'm always around somewhere. Well, how do you do? Mrs. Blake? Yes, what can I do? Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the insurance company. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Come this way. I'm a little surprised, really. I hardly expected them to pay off so promptly. Well, in that case, you won't be too disappointed. Disappointed? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't come here to pay you anything. Then why did you come? I'm a special investigator, Mrs. Blake. What does that mean? The company would like a little more information about your husband's death. I told them all about it in the claim I sent to them. I know, but sometimes oh, it's necessary. so that's the pitch. They're trying to squirm out of it. Why do you say that? Because they sent you here, that's why. And because they always do. I know how those companies operate. Well, you've had experience with them before. No, I haven't. But I'm a real smart girl, Mr. Dollar. And I know a fast shuffle when I see it coming. And a smart girl ought to know better than to yell before she's hurt. Why else would they send out a special investigator? I told you why. They want some more information. What information? What is it they want to know? The details, that's all. Exactly how your husband was killed. I told them all that in the claim. I know. He was look. shot to death with his own gun right here in his own house. Do you mind showing me how it happened? Oh, for the love. Now, look, there won't be any payment until I file my report, Mrs. Blake. All right. You win. When you go after something, you really go after it, don't you? Well, that's what I get paid for. Oh. And what about something you personally wanted? Well, that would depend on how bad I wanted it. I see. Would you like a drink? No, 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 thanks. You won't mind if I have one? Right ahead. Looking at you. Right. Now, uh, if you wouldn't mind... Yeah, I know. Stick to business. All right, come on. Happened over here. 
by the stairway. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Right here. This is where he fell. This is where he died. His gun was lying on the floor beside him. Middle of the night, wasn't it? About two in the morning, we'd been asleep. Why did he come downstairs? I heard a noise of some kind. It woke me up. I shook Ed and told him about it, and he came down to see what it was. He was armed? No. His gun was there on the hall table by the front door. Is that where he usually left it? Yes. Whenever he came home, he always took it off and put it there on the table. Then anyone who knew him would probably know they could find it there. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So, uh, what happened? Like I said, it went on downstairs, and I walked out of the bedroom into the hall. Were there any lights on? Not down here. I turned on the hall light upstairs. Did you hear your husband say anything? No, all I heard was the shots, four or five of them. Then I heard someone run out the front door. And what did you do? I called out to Ed, but he didn't answer. Then I ran downstairs and found him lying here, dead. Did you get a look at the prowler or whoever it was? No, it was too dark. And he ran out as soon as he fired the shots. How did he get into the house? The detective said he forced the lock on the front door. I guess that was the sound that woke me up. And then he used a gun that was inside the house that he may or may not have known was inside the house. That's what the police figure. All right. What do you figure, Mrs. Blake? The same thing, I guess. I don't know any more about it than they do. I thought you might have some theory of your own. I'll string along with them. Uh Uh-huh. Just an accidental prowler who got panicky and snatched up a gun that happened to be lying around handy. I guess that's about it. Any idea at all who the prowler might have been? Of course not. Do you suppose it could have been somebody besides a prowler? Somebody who came here for the express purpose of murdering your husband? It had a lot of enemies, of course, because of his job. What about his friends, Mrs. Blake? What do you mean? Do you suppose one of his friends could have done it? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been admiring your watch. Hmm, real nice. Set in diamonds, emerald band. Must be worth around $2,000. Very nice. Well, thank you. And this house, the furniture, that car out there in the driveway. On a police chief's salary, Mrs. Blake. I... I wouldn't know anything about Ed's financial affairs. Who runs the rackets here in Greensport? What rackets, Mr. Dollar? Was your husband in on them? Sure you won't have that drink? All right, Mrs. Blake, play it your way. I thought the insurance company was probably convinced that I was the one who killed him. They're not convinced of anything yet. But they think I did it, don't they? No, but they think 24 hours is pretty fast for a grief-stricken widow to shoot a claim into the office. I am not grief-stricken, Mr. Dollar. So I've noticed. Do I have to be? Is there some clause in the policy? No, you don't have to be. You think I did it, don't you? I think there's a strong chance you did. Then I think you need a little straightening out. I'll listen. Uh-uh. Why should I make it easy for you? Go see Dave Sherman. Talk to him. Dave Sherman? The city attorney. See what he says before you get all lathered up. See if he thinks I'm guilty. All right, I will. And then we'll talk. And if you're nice enough to me, maybe I'll even cooperate. You never know. Do you? <laughs> Johnny Dollar. This is Dave Sherman, Mr. Dollar, city attorney. Oh, yes. I've been trying to reach you, Mr. Sherman. Yes, so my office tells me. It's the uh, Ed Blake case, I suppose. That's right. Well, I've already told my secretary to make all the records available. It's not the records I'm mainly interested in, Mr. Sherman. I want to talk to you personally. Oh, why? Because I've been informed that you're able to furnish an alibi for my number one suspect. Marty Blake, huh? That's right. Who informed you, Mr. Dollar? Marty Blake. Oh, the lovely widow herself. Right. Well, I guess we'd better have a talk. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes, if you're dead set on lighting a fuse in this town, I may as well give you some matches. Come on over to the courthouse. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Greensport, Missouri, to the Home Office, Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the open town matter. Expense account continued. Items 5 and 6, 70 cents, a copy of the Greensport Daily Herald and a taxi fare to City Hall. 
I opened the paper and glanced over the headlines. Murder of police chief still unsolved. City attorney's office claims new evidence. Mayor Lyons demands action. I could feel for the mayor. My client stood to lose $50,000, life insurance payable to the dead police chief's widow, Marty Blake. So I wanted action, too. And I was hoping to get it from city attorney Dave Sherman. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'll have a seat. Thanks. When did you get in town? Oh, uh, early this afternoon. And you've already met Marty Blake. Well, that figures. Yes, it does. Under the circumstances, her husband has been killed. He carried $50,000 worth of insurance with my company. And Mrs. Blake filed her claim less than 24 hours after his death. So that's why you hot-footed it out here from Hartford, huh? Well, uh, the company figured 24 hours was pretty fast action for a grief-stricken widow. Oh? I don't imagine Marty is grieving too much. Oh, she's not. She told me that herself. Mm. Marty's about 26 or 7. Ed Blake was in his 50s. Uh Uh-huh. Money, maybe? Well, not until he met her. Then he started to make it. Fast. He had to. That's how Marty likes things. Fast. And then he married her. Well, then she married him. Mm. And now, eight months later, she's a widow. With an insurance claim for $50,000. Well, she said she liked things fast. Why, uh, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you may as well back up and start all over. You're off on the wrong foot. Oh, how do you mean? This killing? Oh, sure, it... Worked out perfect for her, made to order. A man could build a pretty good case against her, especially with that 24-hour insurance claim. Yes, that would really cinch it with a jury. I pointed that out to her. Uh Oh, well, I I figured as much. Would you mind telling me what happened? Well, her first move was to start uh, turning on the charm. (laughs) That's one of the easiest things she does, if she thinks it might pay off. And after all, with $50,000 in the office... Sure, Did she give you any of the details, uh, you know, of the uh, night it happened? It uh, bored her to death to even talk about it. Uh And you thought she was putting on an act to uh, maybe throw you off? What would you think? Oh, she wasn't, Mr. Dollar, any more than she was sorry that Ed Blake was murdered. Then she's pretty cold-blooded. Well, that's a moot question. Figuratively, yes, I suppose she is. See, she used to be a dancer. Never good enough to make the big time, so she had to, well... I live by her wits and her charm. But uh, you pointed out things that could look pretty black for her if the case ever got to court. That's right. Huh? What happened? She sent me to you. Why? So I could tell you she didn't kill him. Well, it adds up, Mr. Sherman. Yeah, I know. It was late at night, the two of them alone in the house, her husband shot to death with his own gun. I know, Mr. Dollar, but not by her. Why not? That story about the mysterious prowler has been used before over and over. Matter of fact, I broke one of them not six months ago. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it's true. How do you know? Because you were wrong on one point. They weren't alone in the house. Well, what do you mean? Who else was there? I was. Oh, I see. Hmm. She's as pure as the driven snow. Well, at least so far as Blake's murder is concerned. Yeah, kind of a neat setup, isn't it? Huh? Instead of prosecuting attorney, you're the star witness for the defense. Yes, I... I suppose if it came to that, I'd have to be. I was there when it happened. So that's why she sent me to you, so I could hear it straight from the horse's mouth. That's about it. Well, she couldn't have a much better alibi than the city attorney himself. Thank you. Oh, she's in the clear, Mr. Dollar. How did you happen to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning? I was spending the night. Ed and I were planning to leave early on a fishing trip. Oh, I see. Like to tell me all about it? Certainly. Certainly we'd... uh, all gone to bed around midnight. It was uh, oh, a few minutes before two I woke up. I heard Marty and Ed out in the hall just outside my room. I opened my door and just then Marty snapped on the hall lights. A second later, the shots blasted downstairs, five quick ones. Where was she standing at the time? By the door of her room, not ten feet away from me. So you see, Mr. Dollar, she couldn't have done it. <sighs> so, that's that. She can thank her lucky stars you were there. Oh, Marty's always been lucky. Have you known her a long time? Three or four years. Ever since she came here to Greensport. You and Blake were pretty good friends, I suppose, huh? No. No, as a matter of fact, we didn't have too much use for each other. Oh? Oh, I know it doesn't make sense, going fishing together and spending the night in his home, but... Well, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar. Do you? Yes, you're thinking maybe I need an alibi as much as Marty does. 
Well, it is that kind of an alibi. It works equally well for either of you two. Yeah, only I don't need an alibi. Blake and I had our little differences, that's true, but they weren't serious enough to be a motive for killing him. Maybe Marty herself could be a motive. In what way? How old are you, Mr. Sherman? Thirty-three. Why? And Marty Blake is 27. And a beautiful girl. Her husband was around 52, I believe. <laughs> Wrong guess again, Mr. Dollar. I've known her too long, and what's more important, I know her too well. Meaning? Well, sure, she's a knockout. Uh, I was nuts about her once. She's a... Uh, ah, summer night. Wild honeysuckle and a handful of stars. But there's one great big catch to it. And that is? She's got a built-in jukebox hidden way inside of her. And when you put in money, it plays real pretty music. When you don't... Nothing. Ed Blake found out. And still went on putting in money? He liked the music. And that's why he got mixed up in the rackets. Uh, Police chief's salary was... Well, well, Mr. Dollar, you do get around, don't you? Was Blake running them or just taking orders? Now, what makes you think there are any rackets here? Maybe it was just a guess. Oh, who told you about them? (laughs) It's funny, I can't seem to remember at the moment. I just bet you can't. Suppose you answer my question, Mr. Sherman. Who's behind the rackets here in Greensport? Ah, just a minute. Who did Blake get his orders it. from? Or was he the one who gave I'll the orders? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Dollar. Just take it easy. I'll... Dave, I wonder if you'd mind going over that report on... Oh, uh, sorry. I didn't know you had... No, that's all right, Will. Come on in. This is Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, it's Mayor Lyons. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar's an insurance investigator, Will. He's here to look into Ed Blake's death. Terrible tragedy, Mr. Dollar. We'll appreciate all the help you can give us. Well, so far, Mayor, I'm afraid that doesn't amount to very much. The only theory I had just blew up in my face. Oh? What was this theory? Well, Mr. Dollar suspected Marty Blake of the killing. Well, Dave, didn't you tell him that you... Yes, yes, he told me, Mayor. That's when it blew up in my face. Well, at various times in the past, Mrs. Blake might have been, uh, as one might say, a bit indiscreet. But to consider her capable of cold-blooded murder is utterly unthinkable, sir. Particularly when she was standing just ten feet away from the city attorney at the time. Well, yes, that's true, of course. Just what is the official theory on the shooting, gentlemen? Well, at the moment, I'm afraid we haven't any. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar. When we find Shorty Wells, we'll have the killer. Shorty Wells? A local hoodlum. Blake got him sent up the river a couple of years ago, and Shorty swore that he'd get Blake for it if it was the last thing that he ever did. Oh, well, now that's a fairly common threat, though, for a criminal to make. And usually it's nothing but talk. But Shorty was paroled just last week, Mr. Dollar. He was seen around town the morning before the killing. And we haven't been able to locate him since. I see. Wells did it all right. There's not the least doubt in the world. Yeah, it seems to add up, doesn't it? Yes, and we've got every available man on the lookout for him. But so far, no luck. There's not even a trace of him. Tell me something, Mayor. Would Marty Blake know anything about the rackets her husband was tied in with? Rackets? Why, that's the most preposterous well, thing well, I... Well, it's, it's no use. Mr. Dollar's been talking to somebody, and he's found out that our little city isn't as lily-white as we'd like to pretend. Indeed. It's true, isn't it, Mayor? As I hear it, Greensport is a wide-open town. May as well admit it, Will. He knows it already. There's no point in trying to lie about it. All right. It's true, Mr. Dollar. Uh, but it's not wide open, as you put it. But there are rackets, as unpleasant as it may be to admit it. Do you have any idea who's back of them? I wish to heaven I did. What about you, Mr. Sherman? Well, if I had an idea strong enough to talk about, I'd be talking about it in court. What about this Shorty Wells? Was he in on them before Blake sent him to prison? Yes, supposedly, but he wouldn't spill a word about the setup at his trial. Afraid you, maybe, huh? Probably. Wells is the key to this whole thing, Mr. Dollar. The rackets as well as the killing. Find Shorty Wells, and we can wrap this thing up in ten minutes. Then I guess we'd better find him. Standard theory number two, an ex-convict with a grudge. Number one, young, pretty wife, middle-aged husband, big insurance policy hadn't panned out too well. And I wasn't too sold on the second one. It was just too pat somehow. And the fact that Shorty Wells was missing didn't mean much. If I were an ex-con just out of prison and had threatened a man who was later murdered, I'd be missing too. And yet the pat answer was sometimes the right one. Uh, The case was still like the town itself, wide open. I walked out of City Hall, started down the sidewalk toward the taxi stand. I didn't know what move to try next. Technically, of course, I was out of it. Since the beneficiary had an ironclad alibi, she'd get paid regardless of who actually did kill Blake. I didn't pay any attention to the horn the first time, but when it sounded again, I turned to look. She was parked at the curb a few yards away. Marty Blake. I've been waiting for you, Johnny. Have you? Yes. I wanted to talk to you. 
You didn't earlier. Well, I guess you just rubbed me the wrong way. You weren't very nice to me, you know. Sorry. You've talked to Dave Sherman, I suppose. Yep, yep. He gives you an airtight alibi. Why didn't you tell me he was there that night when I talked with you this afternoon? I might have. If you'd been nicer to me. Oh, I see. You'd have checked it with him anyway. Yeah, I suppose I would have at that. Well, now that you know I'm not a murderess, maybe we can get to be friends, Johnny. You think so? You're still not being very nice. I am always politely respectful toward new widows, Mrs. Blake. At least until after the first week. I told you I didn't care about Ed. Who do you care about, besides yourself? Shorty Wells, by any chance? Shorty Wells? Who told you that? And you know him, huh? Of course I know him. As I used to know him. Where is he now? How should I know? What are you trying to pull? If you think for one minute that you're... Get down, quick! Are you all right, Mrs. Blake? Yes, I guess so. The shots. Johnny, somebody was trying to kill you. How do you know it was me they were shooting at? What? Maybe they were out to kill you, Mrs. Blake. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Before I do that, please let me say thanks to all of you who are so kind about writing and telling us how much you like Johnny Dollar. It's very gratifying, gratifying encouragement to all of us who are involved in production of the program. And we appreciate your letters more than you know. As always, I'll try to answer you promptly, but sometimes the mail does pile up. In any event, thanks. Thanks very much for writing. Tomorrow, an old flame and a new one, and two men get burned. One becomes an alcoholic, the other a human torch. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. I, I love the uh, part in the uh, uh, prosecuting attorney's office between uh, Johnny Dollar and the prosecuting attorney. You could kind of feel the tension start to build there. And I think there's definitely going to be some uh, reaction in that uh, direction. Uh, definitely an interesting case and I like the reference to previous uh, to previous episode uh, of course referring back to um, Qu the Quay Bono matter of course in that case Johnny needed a glow in the dark necktie uh, in order to close the deal all right well now to listener comments and feedback and receive this from Brian hi Adam I thought I'd drop you a line and tell you about our unique listening situation my wife and I are listening to the Midas Touch Matter while driving through real-life Kingman, Arizona. This along with the fact that we've made the trip several times between Vegas and Kingman uh, lends an extra layer of realism and fun to this particular story. It's interesting slash depressing to know that the side roads haven't gotten any better in the years since this story originally aired. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks so much for the email, Brian, and uh, definitely a fun listening uh, situation. I've often wanted to um, 
go and record uh, one of these programs uh, in the city where it was uh, where it was actually set. It was something that I, I had the idea to do early on, but uh, just because of uh, not getting actual uh, sponsors for the show didn't actually pan out, but maybe one of these days. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, and uh, that does remind us the listener support campaign is coming up, and uh, we'll have some exciting uh, additional features this year um, with some more uh, physical uh, prize, uh or thank you gifts available. Uh, one thing we're also going to do is play some previews. You know, we've got so many shows to get to. And so we will play one episode uh, of a show of your choice three weeks in a row uh, in the month of February. And uh, basically what I need from listeners is to email me at box13 at greatdetectives.net with the name of a program we've not played on the series before, and it's not one we're about to play. So we won't do The Saint or Dragnet or Pursuit, since we're going to be playing those shows anyway uh, fairly quickly, or Philip Marlowe. But if you want Richard Diamond or Broadway's My Beat, or you'd like to hear um, Mysteries My Hobby, anything we haven't played and we've got on the big list, uh, just email me at biglist.great or actually that's biglist.greatdetectives.net. It's the address, the web address, and send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. And I'm really, um, also look at the kind of quality and not necessarily just the quantity, but uh, if you've got a good, uh, argument or you've got a good case for why you like this series that we intend to eventually play, but don't quite have it on our list yet. Uh, just send it to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for the case book of Gregory Hood, and we continue on with the Open Town matter on Wednesday. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.